Healthcare Economics Advanced, presented summer 2014. This narration was created in 2015. Written and narrated by Edward J. Harsh. This presentation is intended to be timeless. It omits details of the PPACA, Powerful Politicians Achieving Catastrophe Act, and it ignores um, President Obama. Definition of health care. Is it offset of deterioration or a positive service? Offset of deterioration equals bring me up to some standard that was present before the deterioration began. Positive service is something tangible is being done. Hunger can be offset with food. A car that is about to run out of gasoline, put gasoline in its, in its tank. Same idea. There is a danger of thinking offset of deterioration in the context of health care. If there is a standard to which people are to be brought up, then there is a tendency to think of achieving that standard as a right. Positive service. I want or need something, so I must pay for it. Whoever provides health care wants to get paid. Whoever receives it can be called on to pay for it. Macroeconomics disproved. To understand health economics, including supply and demand, we must look at underlying fundamentals. Macroeconomics is the study of those measurable things that affect an entire economy. It's misleading and irrelevant. Macroeconomics includes measurements of economic activity. But economic activity is not the same as wealth creation. One example that is proof is the refrigerator and the ice man. Many years ago we had ice boxes. They kept things cool and were powered by blocks of ice which slowly melted and had to be replenished daily. There was activity of harvesting the ice in winter, storing it, and delivering it year-round. Nowadays we use refrigerators. Buy one refrigerator and it lasts for years. We pay less for the electricity than we would pay for daily ice deliveries. Macroeconomics says we get poorer, but consumers benefit. Consumers benefit from the changeover from ice boxes to refrigerators. That's why we use refrigerators. Macroeconomics says there is less money being spent, so we get poorer. But we actually spend less for the same value, so we are richer. What of the displaced icemen? They won't all be working building refrigerators. People who would do ice deliveries are working at something else instead. The something else increases total productivity and wealth. So on average, we are more prosperous, not less. Another example. A car crash causes car damage that must be repaired. Economic activity results. Loss of value to the car is not subtracted in normal economic analysis, which in turn shows income to the tow truck operator, the body shop, uh, the auto parts manufacturer, and so on. Attention is paid only to activity and not to the total picture. Plant a garden, grow vegetables, and spend less in the supermarket. Use home theaters instead of buying tickets and going to real theaters. Measured income drops, but value to the consumer does not and may actually increase. Another example is the recent trend in doing things oneself, not hiring someone to do it for you. This process dodges income and payroll taxes. This analysis is important because liberals tend to look at economic activity, not true wealth, when they analyze something. The best health care, low cost to the patient, high revenue to the doctor, nurse, hospital, or whoever does the work. Therefore, as little money as possible should be diverted on the way from whoever pays to the doctors, hospitals, nurses, and such. In reality, this simplification does not work because regulations convert doctors and hospitals and nurses into adversaries. Liability issues and insurance make a further mess. Doctors are under pressure to toss patients out of hospitals quickly. They can also be sued by patients who are discharged early. Hospital bylaws protect the hospitals, but not the doctors and nurses who work in them. Meanwhile, nurses themselves get heavier and heavier workloads as hospital bosses demand more from them. With rapid discharges of patients, 
convalescent patients being discharged sooner, the average inpatient is becoming more and more ill, so the nurses have to work harder for the same number of patients. High provider revenue. Regulations are complicated and voluminous, facilitating errors and increasing costs. These regulations change often. Hospitals often have at least one full-time administrator whose only job is to keep up with the latest changes and let other people in the hospital know how to react to those changes. Major penalties exist for errors, but the regulations are so cumbersome and perhaps contradictory of each other that accidental errors are unpreventable. Selective enforcement can occur. A hospital full of cronies may get off with little or no penalty, whereas an independent hospital could face a substantial penalty or even um, risk being shut down. The process of learning regulations and figuring out how to follow them thereby cuts into revenue for providers. This process is separate from the direct cost of actually following the regulations if those regulations are assumed to be understood. Low patient cost. Educate the patient. Dentists, for example, say brush your teeth. They don't send someone to your house to brush them for you. There is a certain instruction for how patients should take care of themselves, and patients are expected to do so. Health education in general is missing from school education. Available access ex to information now exists so that patients can keep their costs low by doing research and learning what is the best way to diagnose or treat something. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration, or, or whatever, prevents dissemination of many true statements about natural remedies. Available access to information allows patients to keep their costs low. Another thing that should exist is schools do not teach how to identify a destructive potential boyfriend or girlfriend when they are teaching elementary school children. Psychologists, social workers, special ed education teachers, and such are paid better if there are many interpersonal messes to clean up and disabled and dysfunctional children than if there is an equal number of normal, healthy children. Available access to treatments. The FDA prevents some, such as intravenous hydrogen peroxide in ambulances, no treatments. They're not legal. Hospitals, meanwhile, prevent others that the FDA permits. EDTA chelation, instead of bypass grafting, would cost about $4,000 instead of $100,000, in addition to being much less painful and much less risky. State medical boards also interfere with progress. Effective and low-cost treatments damage revenue streams from the medically organized relying on nonsense entrenched establishment. Healthcare regulation is a hidden tax. Insurers practice price discrimination. Medicare, for example, is legal price fixing for the elderly. Low Medicaid payments encourage providers to raise prices against other customers, doing what in economic jargon is called cost shifting. Providers default to charging more from the privately insured and still more from the uninsured, for these people have little or no bargaining power about the charges. This is unfair to the uninsured ill. If healthcare establishment needs tax money at all, which is doubtful, then the healthy can earn it and provide it more easily, on average, than can the chronically ill. Compassionate providers are strained by having to be tax assessors and collectors. The healers, the ones who are most upset by having to take unequal amounts of money from the ill, receive preventable damage to their morale and are pressured toward burnout. Insurance. Insurance is intended to offset major unpredictable expense. It can also be a bargaining agent if providers sign contracts with insurers to accept the insurance price lists. Asking prices for doctor visits, hospital stays, etc. are usually greatly inflated, much higher than the doctor or hospital expects to receive. Doctors and hospitals expect to get much less than they ask for. They usually accept the insurance pricing. We the people want low prices. Of course, doctors and hospitals would benefit from high prices. But who 
benefits from the high nominal high asking prices, which is not the same as the real prices. Unions. They want to threaten employees with high prices unless the employees join a union and pay union dues. Big employers with insurance plans also, for they want to threaten potential employees with high medical costs unless they accept low pay while working for these employers. Who else? Liberals. Liberals cannot claim credit for giving gov government relief for high health care prices if there are no high health care prices because health care is in inexpensive to begin with. And who else? Rich liberals. They won't mention something at social gatherings that might cut into someone else's income. At a cocktail party, why anger someone who might be a hospital president? Insurers as negotiators. This is a legitimate role. There are unscrupulous providers. Preventive services are predictable and are not insurable because they are not risks. Insurers as negotiators. Insurers should be forced to offer their negotiated prices to all patients who will pay them a fee for the negotiation. So that any patient, insured by them or not, will get the benefit of the low negotiated insurance payment rate. That way, no price discrimination can occur, no cost shifting. If insurers have to offer their reduced prices to anyone who pays, then 1. Price discrimination stops. 2. Competitive, as in low, prices become the norm. 3. Medicaid, for example, can get money from its negotiating fees. Healthcare provider payments. The goods versus services distinction is wrong. Hire a taxi, rent a car and drive it yourself, lease a car long term, or buy a car outright. Where on this continuum does a service become a good? A better distinction is between low overhead and high overhead. A low overhead job is, for example, a house cleaner. High overhead job, astronaut. A high overhead job requires major expense to create the job and train someone to do it. The effects of the expense last years. A high overhead job is not necessarily paid well. Investing in high overhead job creation requires an expectation that the job will exist until the useful life of the investment has ended. Medical education in this context is a risky investment. Medical education is risky if hard bargaining is feared and may later reduce the prices of health care to variable cost only. That means that the fixed cost in medical education may be a total loss. The risk will discourage investment in healthcare education by medical and nursing students. A long term shortage of healthcare providers may occur, and years will be needed to correct such a shortage. If there is no measurable shortage, watch out for deteriorating quality of the doctors and nurses. It's there. Smart people who understand this reasoning will be scared away from health care. The profession is being dumbed down already. The dual reimbursement model. Structure of how to pay for health care. Suppose you are a physician and are offered a fee-for-service contract by a local factory. That means high revenue if many patients show up, fee-for-service, but potential heavy loss due to overhead if few or no people show up at all. Suppose instead you are a physician and are offered a fixed fee per patient per year for some people because an HMO, healthcare, health maintenance organization, has some patients that need care. That means high revenue if everyone stays healthy and you don't need to do any work, but you risk a big loss if there is an epidemic or other major need for health care. But if you accept both offers and the demands of patient categories go up and down at the same times, then your overhead is guaranteed and the more you work, the more you get paid. If the variable, the per patient encounter revenue exactly offsets the expense, 
and the fixed revenue offsets the fixed expense with a reasonable profit left over, and the contract lasts as long as the fixed assets, so it can be assigned but not cancelled, then the medical practice has zero financial risk. And if the medical practice has zero financial risk, then the on average amount paid to it for a given amount of work and of risk for the work that might occur is as low as possible because healthcare workers don't need to pay, be paid extra to take that risk. Inference from this analysis. To minimize payments for health care, structure them so that fixed and variable costs are separately calculated and paid. This protocol eliminates risk and no one needs to charge for it. By reducing the monetary risk that the doctors and hospitals accept, the amount that they are willing to accept as fair payment is kept as low as possible. So far, this analysis mentions absolutely nothing about who actually pays. Investors, ordinary patients, etc., can sign contracts to pay a fixed fee monthly in exchange for a finite amount of care at variable cost only. This contract is an agreement to provide a service. It is not insurance. It is theoretically possible for a healthcare investor to make a deal with doctors and hospitals to buy the right to obtain specified amounts of care at a predetermined price. This right will be transferable. Then you buy what you think you will need, or you buy from a healthcare investor if you prefer. You can make deals as you wish with doctors and hospitals and pay them directly if you prefer. It's not required. If you buy too much health care, you can give the excess to charity, or just plain sell it. Right to purchase arrangements can be designed by insurance companies, cooperatives, or pretty much anyone. And if this arrangement seems needlessly complicated, you can take a look at um, the financial marketplace, stocks, bonds, options, derivatives, and the like. If this method is, is not good, it should not be condemned only because of its complexity. The complexity is very easily managed with existing monetary instruments. The system allows shrewd patients to buy healthcare scripts and maybe make a profit from them. There is no reason not to allow such speculation. Consider airplane overbooking and damages paid to consumers who get bumped off one flight and have to take a later one. It's a better deal for airlines if they risk paying damages once in a while for overbooking a flight than risk too many empty seats instead. Of course, most health care will be bought at first by insurers and major investors. And insurers can decide what to cover according to what the free market says. If ordinary people can buy and sell health care script for a profit, why not? The bond underwriter scam. This is important because it shows a bias in financial markets toward keeping money away from ordinary people, including small investors. Stock and bond underwriters often cheat the stockholders. Big corporations hire underwriters when they sell big dollar issuances of securities because they need to expand or otherwise have a need for $100 million or $500 million, which is a, an amount of money too big for most banks. Corporations could, instead of hiring underwriters, give stockholders the options to purchase such stocks and bonds, etc., in such a way that the price of those options is small but positive. That way, stockholders who get the options, not underwriters, get the unpredictable profit when the stock or bond offering is priced slightly too low. Stockholders would thereby get the profits by selling their options on the open market or using the options themselves by buying the new stocks or bonds at a slightly below the market price. The small investor should get that money, not the underwriters. Similarly to the airlines, penalty fees to bumped off airline customers are worth the risk. Underwriter fees can and should be diverted to the stockholders when stock and bond offerings are made. There is no intrinsic prohibition against ordinary people's investing in healthcare. 
The culture of investments in finance tends to frown on allowing ordinary people to acquire money through speculation. This is very wrong. Insurance, technology, and the death decision. Health insurers are trapped by changing risk. If you buy a bigger house or bigger car, your insurance premiums for the house or the car will go up. But if medical technology changes, premiums do not go up without various regulatory um, hurdles and other uh, obstacles faced by the insurance companies. To live or to die if you are seriously ill or badly injured. That's between you and God. You and God have a personal decision to make. No death squad in the insurance company has the right to condemn you to death just because keeping you alive is annoyingly expensive. Conversely, no one is intrinsically required to keep you alive. People have willingly fought and died for our freedom. They valued our freedom more than their own lives. It's immoral to confiscate someone else's freedom to pay for care to keep you alive. Otherwise, the very foundation of our liberty is destroyed. That attitude sacrifices freedom. Because whoever has to pay for the care to keep you alive loses freedom to the extent that ad assets are forcibly taken from them for that purpose. If heroic measures to prolong the life of someone terminally ill are expensive, then there is no intrinsic duty of the taxpayer to pay it. Responsibility that should be individual or should be delegated to private donors and charities is being usurped by the government. Letting people die if they are irresponsible is not a repudiation of Christianity. See the prodigal son, for example, Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. In the prodigal son, the father did not look for and rescue him. The prodigal son returned broke and begged, did not expect as an entitlement, but begged for a servant job. The father said to the loyal son, all that I have is yours. There was no reapportionment of assets to benefit the prodigal son. There was no forcible transfer of assets from the hard working to the lazy spendthrift. So says Jesus. Patients should be free to pay extra for specified services or to not pay and do without. One size fits all insurance is unreasonable. Different people have different attitudes about risk and insurance. If you make a decision to accept low insurance payments and some risk that an uninsured expense will go unpaid and you die, then you have made a business decision and if such a risk does in fact occur, you will die with honor. If you die with honor, then you won't drag down anyone else. And if death worries you, then plan ahead and buy insurance at your own expense. You decide. Government does not. Liberals hate this reasoning. They are too lazy spiritually to make the decision as individuals. They do not pay attention to God. They do not want to consider death. They also have a tendency to make decisions based on mood. They expect forgiveness if, having made a selfish decision, they encounter unexpected major stress. This is a side effect of the nanny state. We live in a world of safety nets. Emotion-driven decisions of feel-good liberals don't cause natural consequences to those who make such decisions. They get the glory, and we the taxpayers feel the pain. If the government surrounds us with safety nets, then the nets turn into cages. This is a trap. Many poor people ask for money for health care or for insurance. But they can pay for alcohol, cigarettes, junk food, big TV sets, mobile phones, and other items not needed for life. Watch the response when you offer money to a so-called poor person in exchange for a promise to do without these things. Expect anger, not understanding and cooperation, if you do so. Question. What is the most common thing in the USA life in which material aid is offered in exchange for lifestyle restrictions? Answer. Prisons. 
pre-existing medical condition problem. This is very easily solved uh, without the need for regulation. The increase in premium that results from having a chronic condition can be translated by standard financial calculations to a lump sum. If you know finance, the term for this is net present value. So, you simply make the old insurer, the one that the patient is leaving, pay the new one that the patient is going to start using, that lump sum. Insurers won't be so quick to harass away ill patients if they must pay to do so. Meanwhile, they will receive big money to care for the ill and won't mind taking them on. Abandoning care entirely and letting, collecting the lump sum can occur. Let heirs, not the insurer, get the money. If someone decides, uh, forget this care, I am ready to die, cancel the insurance. This payout does not have to be a government windfall, as are estate taxes nowadays. Interlocking ownership. Sure, the drug and insurance companies will resist health care overhaul that will cut their revenues, but so will many other corporations. Interlocking ownership here is the condition whereby the owner or owners of one corporation or other asset also own another corporation or asset. The problem occurs when owning one induces business decisions that hurt the other. If most of the stock of a corporation is owned by pension funds and other aggregations of stock that also in own stock in drug and insurance corporations, then the stockholders will tell the corporation to self-sacrifice to the drug and insurance companies so as to maximize the total stockholder wealth. It's also a problem in education. Teachers union pension funds are invested partially in health care. Teachers therefore have a money incentive to not teach their children how to not need to pay for health care. The consequences of interlocking ownership look very much like a conspiracy. Big business and big government seem to coordinate as if there is an unseen mastermind at work, even if there isn't. What free market change in federal law, if enacted, will help solve this problem of interlocking ownership? Hint, it will make legal and enforceable a voluntary decision by corporations, and it won't force anyone to do anything. Answer. Legislation that allows a publicly traded corporation to require all of its stockholders to not own any stock in competing industries that it specifies. The prohibition on competing industries is probably more important than competing corporations in the same industry. If a corporation does not compete against other corporations its stockholders own, then it will not be dragged down from genuine innovation and improvement by large blocks of stockholders with conflicts of interest. Example of this hypothetical legislation at work. A car manufacturer says, don't own any airline stock if you own its own stock. Then improvements in car manufacturer profits will not upset any of its stockholders if car travel becomes more desirable and therefore airline profits go down. This remedy, in healthcare, may reduce total corporate profits if one healthcare corporation can improve itself. But if total corporate profits go down for the same amount of consumer benefit, then, as mentioned previously, the consumers get richer, even though macroeconomics says they get poorer. In healthcare, insist on putting the citizenry first and tell mutual fund managers to consider selling drug and insurance stock. Then any corporation not sharing ownership with healthcare entities can work freely to lower healthcare costs. There would also be much less such pressure from pension funds and such if we could abolish the income tax and the need for such financial in instruments as pension funds, IRAs, KO plans, and the like. Watch also for corporations that want the cost of health care to be high, bullying workers into taking very low pay to get protection from overpriced health care. Big labor has a similar motive for high health care prices. This reasoning means that we cannot simply entrust the management of our financial assets to someone else. 
we have to make our own decisions, invest in drugs or invest in cars, for example, but n do not invest in both. Here is one of several examples that the price of freedom is vigilant. Pay it. Education. Schools need to teach fundamentals of physical examination, safe and effective home remedies, simple methods to manage interpersonal conflicts, and other health-related issues. A school child is more likely to be confined to a wheelchair sometime in his or her life than to be a professional athlete. So where are the wheelchair sports? Continuing med medical education keeps physicians up to date. But who decides what is proper information for that purpose and what is not? If health material is useful for physicians, then it should be approved for continuing medical education credit. Such approval should not be conditional on the ivory tower status of its writer. The American Medical Association is involved in con approving continuing medical education. Do not think it will permit being bypassed if someone offers a CME course that reduces revenue for physicians or for the American Medical Association itself. Adult education should be available in public schools for people who want to learn how to take care of themselves. I found it difficult to offer such a course, got a hostile reception at the local high school, and had to give up. How to fight back. Don't give money to the enemy. Get a high medical expense rider on your car insurance in case of motor vehicle smash-ups. Eat right, exercise rationally, and keep your living quarters safe. Reduce the risk of needing medical care to begin with. Avoid needless physical risks. Use medical tourism. Go bargain hunting. Remember that even biggest travel expense uh, can be far less than the amount of money saved if you travel um, several mi uh, thousand miles within the USA or even leave the nation entirely. Use naturopaths. Find out what natural remedies can solve your problems instead of prescription drugs, and you will not have to get refills on prescription drugs uh, over and over again. Avoid mental illness. Stay away from people with destructive personalities. Do such people follow God? No, they don't. Beware social pressures. Watch for brittle cordiality and an apparent need to conform. If entrenched interests such as high-status jerks in school give you a hard time, then treat such incidents as medals. Brag about them. They are badges of honor. They show that you are not subservient to a corrupted society. Keep government out of health care. The end.